Hello, and welcome to Best Story Wins. I'm your host, Josh Ritchie, and I'm here with my co-host, Jason Lenkow. And today, our guest is Joe Chernoff, the CMO of Pendo. Joe, thanks for being on. How's it going? It's great. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Thanks to both of you for having me. Nice to see you, Joe. So can you give us a quick overview of what your day-to-day at Pendo looks like and what makes your role unique? Uh, sure, but it's not going to be super exciting. Um, you know, if you want to be an active marketer, like if you want your job to be marketing a product, stop at VP. Because once you're CMO, you're like the day is it's a lot of HR stuff. It's a lot of personnel. It's recruiting. It's uh, general directional guidance to the business. It's working with the other members of the C team on whatever project is like most acute at that moment. So the days vary pretty greatly depending on the rhythm of the business, but there's less actual marketing than there was when I was a VP. Like I look at it as your job transitions from marketing to people to marketing through people. Uh, And it just, it gets to be more adult as a CMO. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And for those that maybe uh, haven't come across Pendo, um, before, can you give a little overview of uh, what you all do and maybe what was uh, initially attracting you to the company? Sure. Uh, Pendo is an all-in-one product experience platform. So anything that happens inside a digital product, Pendo tracks and then provides the builders or the administrators of that product with insight into how people are using it, where they're getting stuck, how they can help people discover value more quickly. So it's intelligence inside of a digital product. What attracted me to the role is the persona. When I joined Pendo, we marketed really solely to product management. And it was this like kind of perfect hybrid role where it was just line of business enough that there was a lot of fun marketing we could do for them. But it was just technical enough that a lot of companies hadn't really invested in marketing to that role. And so it hadn't been strip mined, so to speak, by marketers quite yet. Mm. That's super interesting. Uh, you you mentioned that uh, being in a CMO role is a little bit more adult. Um, and you touched on some of the HR components of, of the role. Uh, could you share a little bit about uh what one of the biggest challenges that you face looks like in your position and how you navigate it potentially on a one-off basis or maybe on a rolling basis. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I got some really great advice when I took over the CMO role at Pendo. So here I am, I get sort of, uh, promoted from, you know, internally into the CMO role and I've got this really intense CRO that wants pipeline. I've got the CEO who is super passionate about brand and then all these other like kind of little fires all throughout the, uh, the function. And so I called Kip Bodner at HubSpot and I was like, Kip, you got to help me out, man. How do I manage pipeline? How do I manage simultaneously brand? Then there's product marketing. How do I manage that? How do, how do I cover all this service area? And he's like, you're looking at it all wrong. You manage the person who manages brand, but that person manages brand. You manage a person who manages pipeline, but that person manages pipeline. And this all goes back to what I had said the CMO's job is. It's no longer marketing to people. It's marketing through people. And like that sounds like a tweet or something, but it's far more substantial than that. Like your job really is to market through people. And that was the big realization is that you are literally only as effective as your team is. And so the whole role, like I, I didn't mean to trivialize HR and saying like, that's where a lot of my day is uh, because I'm only successful if my people are exactly the right person at the right time for the business in the right role. Uh, and that's really how my CEO judges me. It's really how he judges all of his directs is, are you good at hiring? Uh, because it's the only way you're going to scale what you do. Yeah. That's really good advice for any aspiring marketing leader. Um, And we know marketing can be just as a practice can be really challenging. uh, And that's probably what attracts a lot of us to 
roles in marketing. Could you tell us a little bit about a time where you took a big risk and it paid off uh, and maybe you failed or maybe a situation in which you took a risk and you just learned a big lesson? Um, yeah, it's funny. It was a risk I didn't want to take. I think it was 2021, all the COVID years kind of mushed together. Um, but we have this user conference called Pendemonium. Terrific name. CEO came up with it. wasn't my name. Uh, and it was not only like kind of like still the like really weird days of COVID, but there were weird days that were getting weirder because it kept being these variants that would come out and nobody knew if like the next variant was the big doomsday variant. And there was like kind of political underpinnings uh, that were really beginning to show their face at that time. And so we wanted to do a live pandemonium. We'd done it virtual the year before and it was a little uninspired. And my CEO was like really passionate about doing a live event. And the sales team was like understandably a little reticent to try to like convince people to get on an airplane. That was risky. Uh, and fly to Raleigh, North Carolina, political complications, right? And then come to an event with other people. And But he was really hell-bent that this was the right thing to do for the business and, frankly, the right thing to do for the industry, get people back out and safely. And I was squeamish, and I was kind of getting convinced by sales that, like, People were uncomfortable bringing it up and maybe it's not the right thing to do and the optics aren't great. And I was getting influenced by my head of events who's world-class, but she was like, look, this, is this a time we want to break from the pack? Is this the area we want to stick our neck out? Like we can do a great virtual event. So I went to my CEO and was like, Hey, look, I really want to do it live, but, and I was kind of, chicken shit over this like I kind of deflected and made it external and he's like you know we're doing it live don't you like you know that's going to happen so just tell me what will make you comfortable in a live format what would you do knowing that it's going to happen live and I said I would make it 100% outdoors 100% tested and I would turn it into a festival people get on airplanes to do something fun they're not going to go get on an airplane necessarily. They'll find an excuse to do something corporate. So make it the least corporate thing possible. Have it be just enough boondoggle that people are like willing to go to bat to go. And he's like, all right, done. That's what we're going to do. Good job. It's going to be a live festival. Now fill the room. And he made me solve my own problem, but he gave me the, he gave me this sort of um, non-negotiable which was it was going to be live. And it was a great event. Like that was one of the best events I've ever been to. And um, yeah, that was a risk that we took. And I would have chickened out of the risk if I hadn't been pushed. I'm sure sure uh, Bill O'Reilly was the most quoted person during that era. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a weird time, man, wasn't it? Yeah. So it, it overall is, you know, and we've, uh, you know, been aware of your work for ages now and, you know, back in your Eloqua days and kind of the early battles of marketing automation titans with Marketo and HubSpot. And uh, I, I'm really curious to hear about your overall brand philosophy, because uh, I think you've always been great at those brand plays. And, you know, what, what's the overall kind of guiding light that drives you there? Uh, um, to the extent that I have a philosophy, I mean, that's going to bestow more significance on my perspective than, uh, I guess then, um, maybe it merits, but I genuinely think of thought as a burden and people just like want to shed the burden of having to think. So how can a brand message in a way that just allows people to feel something and relieves them the burden of contemplation. 
right? Like we make purchasing decisions emotionally and then we justify those decisions rationally. So if I can, if I can arouse that emotional bias by making people feel a certain way, helping somebody identify with something that like they're proud to identify with, then the rational stuff is easy. And so I think most marketers try to make an intellectual case. And I think that door is simply a harder one to open because everybody's fighting to get through the same damn door. And even in B2B, I think there is an opportunity to, um, to appeal to somebody on a, you know, on a, on a human level, on a, on a, um, on an emotional level. I think Jason Miller that you mentioned the, you know, Titans of marketing automation. I think Jason Miller at Marketo absolutely got this. Um, you know, he, Marketo, what they would do is, I thought this was genius. You signed with Eloqua and we would say, congratulations, we're going to take you to Paris Island and beat you down and build you back up in our likeness. We're going to teach you how to be great. Marketo would say, congratulations, you've signed with Marketo. You are a rock star marketer. You're a top 1% marketer. And like, who wants to go to Paris Island? Nobody. Well, I, some of the most important people in the country, Marines, go to Paris Island. But most people don't have the wherewithal to sign up for that. I know I don't. Most people take the Marketo path, right? Which is you sign the contract, you automatically are a top 1% marketer. And they got that. They really got that fundamentally. Okay. So you're, you're sharing some great gems here. And I would, I would uh, challenge you that, that your response actually was quite a philosophy there. So, uh, but I, I'm curious on to go down this train a bit further. What, what other advice do you keep front of mind and share with other people? I mean, yeah. Like, Whenever possible, try to create the town where all children are above average. Uh, like, I've had this thing I've wanted to do at Pendo for a long time. And there's a data structure challenge that makes it difficult to do. But what I've wanted to do is divide product management into X number of successful KPIs. And then find in our customer base, look at every single customer and find which KPI they are ahead of the pack in. Compare everybody to one another and find which areas they're ahead of the pack. And then send a note to them that's written in such a way that they can forward it to their boss, that incentivizes them to forward it to their boss, that says we're better than 80% of other companies at enter variable onboarding. Somebody else gets where better than 90% of everyone at enter variable product led growth. And as a result, like they don't know that they're in the 10 percentile in every other area. It's a town where all children are above average. Show them where they're succeeding and do it in such a way that provides a motivation for them to create more visibility for that. I think, um, I think of that a lot. I think of how can I create this situation where everyone is a winner often. Like if you think of what really did in, what's that social media grading company, Clout? If you think of what really did in Clout, you got a score. And nobody liked getting a low score, right? Wordle gives you a score for how you know lucky you were. Nobody likes to have a high luck score. But if everybody has some persona and all of those persona are positive, then there is more of a motivation to go back and do it again. There's more of an incentive to develop that emotional affinity with that organization versus, you know, just being marketed to on an intellectual level, right? Those two link together. If you create the land where all children are above average, you're essentially building a bond between that person and the company. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, so you've talked a lot about your philosophy and this is, there's already been a ton of wisdom shared already, which is, uh, I feel like I've already taken a lot of great notes myself, but in terms of the application, 
Um, what do you think some of the skills are that have helped you the most uh, in your career? The ones that a, an aspiring marketing leader just starting out should really aspire to hone themselves. Don't do my skills. Do your own skills, right? Like um, I've got, I'm really into my kids' baseball, like awkwardly into it. And um, my buddy is a very accomplished coach. And I was asking him for advice. And he's like, take the things your kids is good at and have him do the, more of that. Where the instinct is typically to take the things you're bad at and spend your time investing there. He's like, find what allows him to be on the field and make him the best on the team at those things. And all of our instincts take us in a totally opposite direction. So what I wouldn't want somebody to do is try to be good at the things that have uh, contributed to me having some measure of success in my career. Because what's allowed me to have some measure of success in my career is uh, insecurity. Like I went to a pretty mediocre college, if I'm being generous. I never took a single marketing class. I never took a single business class. And I just sort of stumbled into a marketing career. And as a result, I've like, never really felt like I belonged in the room. And so a lot of my work is trying to explain something to myself. And that's allowed me to get simpler and simpler and simpler with the messaging. And even like when I was at Eloqua, the big content series we did, the Grande Guide series that explained all these new marketing practices, those were purely written for me so I could understand my own job. And as it turns out, being able to say something simply is a really valuable skill. Um, and so I've been really focused on an audience of one, can I say something that even I could understand? But that isn't going to be transferable to everyone. If somebody has an MBA and they're super quant, right? Like, damn, like lean into that and be the best at that, right? Um, and so I would say, look at the skill. I'm going to take my buddy, Chris, look at the skill that allows you to be on the field and enhance this, that skill and be best in class at that skill. Don't try to play somebody else's game. Yeah, that's great. You talked a, a bit about how in becoming a CMO, you're not so much marketing to people anymore. You're marketing through them, which I think is a great way of framing it. Um, are there some things that as a CMO, you still get to kind of get your hands dirty with? And if so, what are some of your favorite things to, to work on that are, you know, marketing um, that, you know, or that are things that most people think about when they think of mar marketing? Is it like brainstorming? Is it writing? Is it something else? Yeah. Um, look, I don't want to be all doomsday and tell people don't be a CMO. You're just in meetings all day. I mean, you kind of are. But the beauty is you can pick whatever damn project you want to work on and just work on that because you're the boss, right? Uh, and so I have thrown my weight around, so to speak, on a few projects where I'm like, we're going to do this and it's going to ship by that date. One was, um, well, a recent one I'll say is uh, I was talking to John Miller, Marketo guy, uh, founder of Marketo. And every once in a while, we have this sort of anonymous club where we tell each other uh, things that are working in, uh, in our business. And, you know, um, we share notes and tell somebody if there's an area they should invest in. And he was talking about certifications uh, when he said demand based and how certifying people in account based everything, ABX was their acronym, was um, like had a major impact on the business. So I, uh, we started a certification program and I was really into what the quality was going to look like, what the packaging was going to look like, what the topics were going to be, who the educators were going to be. But then beyond that, like I didn't want to get into recording. I didn't want to work with the studio. I didn't want to, you know, get into that level. I'm not particularly good at that level of detail. And to this 
you know, a year later, certifications generate half of our demand and for free. So literally 50% of our leads, um, I don't pay a dime for. It's all organic. So that was an area that I jumped into. Another thing, like I wrote my CEO today for a brand idea I have, particularly in Europe, that is totally borrowed from the 1976 ad campaign for the movie The Omen. And I do have a CEO that I can send a note to saying like, hey, I got to talk to you. But like, if you think back on the movie, The Omen, let me tell you how they promoted that film. And I think we can borrow from it. Like that's a luxury to have a CEO that is even willing to entertain that discussion. So that brings me joy. What are, what are you most excited about on, on the things you have coming down the pipeline right now? Um, Todd's our CEO and he's really pushed me to get back to the things I'm good at. And that's like things like borrowing from the owner. And so his point of view, and it lines up with what I was saying about the advice for my kid in baseball. His philosophy is, what is the one thing you can do in the business better than anyone else in the business? And you should spend a disproportionate amount of your time on that. And I have somebody that's better at pipeline than I am. That person reports to me. Now, the energy of the business pulls me in a direction where I spend a lot of time worrying about pipeline, right? Um, but he's like, walk away from it. Do the thing that nobody else in the business can do as well as you. And so something that has me excited is that like I'm getting I'm getting pushed into the areas that I feel like uh and leadership feels like I can add the most value rather than getting pulled into this sort of natural inertia in the business. And so I'm gonna spend a lot of time trying to think of ways that our brand can break away from the pack and not just be sort of this like genericized version of what everybody else in the space looks like, ergo like the omen conversation. And so that has me excited. Yeah, that, that's a great segue to the next question that I wanted to ask you. Um, and so our podcast is called Best Story Wins, and that's rooted in our belief that your story is how you differentiate, how you compete, and ultimately, if you doing a good job, it's how you win in your market. So in your opinion, what are the keys to telling a great brand story? I think there's a couple of things that have to happen. I always like an origin story. Like where did the idea come from? Um, what were the initial hurdles? Like how did you get it off the ground? What were the, what was the threat right off the bat? Who didn't believe in you? I think that is really important. Uh, it really helps if there's like a twist or a paradox, right? Like something that maybe seemed contradictory originally, but then you inspect it a little more closely and it's logical, but like something that has like this unexpected turnabout. And then like bonus points, if I use word surface area a lot, but if there's surface area in this story that people can see some of themselves, that they can identify with in some way, which goes back to kind of one of the themes here is like this emotional resonance. How can you know people buy emotionally and make the decision to buy emotionally and then validate it intellectually? Is there a way that people can kind of see or feel some of themselves in that story? And now you have surface area to which people can attach emotionally. I think if your story has those elements, you're, um, you've got an outsized chance of being successful. What are, what are some of the most interesting and unique or you know, just effective ways that you and your team tell the brand story? I think we really know our persona, at least our original persona. Our, our persona have expanded from the foundation of the company. But man, we are, when it comes to product managers, we are the patron saint of the product manager. Like we really get that persona. 
And that's why those certifications I mentioned were really popular, are really popular. Product manager is like stuck between two worlds. They're stuck between engineering that has, frankly, let's face it, all the clout and tech companies and go to market. And they're like wedged right in between. And so it's a, it's a role that they don't have a lot of authority. They have influence, but not authority. And so we're able to tell the story because like kind of we get that nuance about them and not just academically. We have the certification program to allow them to improve their stature in an organization. We did content on cognitive biases that have an outsized impact on product managers. So we kind of like pointed out to them, almost showed them a, a reflection of themselves. Like these are the traps you can fall into as a product manager through your own biases because we've got them too. That was really popular. So I think the key to our ability to tell a brand story is that we get the person we're telling it to. But now we have another buyer, IT, and um, application owners inside large enterprises, like the person responsible for deploying Salesforce. We don't know that role quite as well. And so those stories don't come as naturally to us. And so what we have to do is resist our own bias of going back to telling the story of the product manager because it's more comfortable and more natural and easier, frankly. And we've got to pull ourselves out of that comfort and really learn that persona so we can be just as confident in the stories we tell to them. That's really cool. I, I, I think the certification piece you mentioned is so fascinating. And I can see that as a brand play. What What is the, how does that connect to a specific story that, that you're trying to convey? There's not a, there's not a story per se in which certification is a setting or is a character. It's like the overall story to me is that we get you when it comes to the product manager, like that we're kind of like inside their head and like they feel seen by us. And one of the plights of a product manager is the lack of authority. And, you know, engineering gets the budget, engineering gets the recognition internally and sales gets the money. And wedged in between is this like kind of a, some of it's shouldering the load of both teams. And so certification for us fits into the narrative by us finding ways to shine a light on the progress that the product manager and the product management function are making. So I don't think it's tied into a story as much as it is a, as much as it reflects an understanding of somebody's job and what that really means. Yeah, it sounds like you guys are in a way kind of bringing them into the story, right? And they're becoming like a character in what you're what you're telling and they get to see themselves maybe in this new light that wasn't that wasn't there before. Yeah, or is like, that a stretch? No, it's it's not like I think we're the wingman to the product manager in the story, right? We're the sidekick. Um so no, I don't think it's a stretch. And I, I also use, we talked about philosophies. I sometimes say like, hold up a mirror in front of the person, but make sure it's the most flattering mirror possible, right? Yeah, it's good. Yeah, very cool. What are some of the brands that you look to and uh, view as like leaders in their space or just brands that you're really inspired by? And it could be in any industry. Um. I mentioned baseball. I There's a brand called Warstick. I actually just so happen to have some of their gear on right now. Um, that it's owned by a former MLB player, a designer, and Jack White from the White Stripes. And like he invested, Jack White did, because he just loves good design. And it's just like beautiful designed um, stick sports gear. It started as baseball. It's a bunch of stuff now. And it's just all stunning. And it's weird, right? Because like most sporting goods are all like very NASCAR-y, right? They're loud and it's just, it's just ugly design. And they, their stuff is just 
so stunning. So I, um, I really love that brand. And they have stories. Like every one of the guys, the designer has a story. Jack White naturally has a story. The MLB player has a story. And the brand is like the composite of their stories. And their showroom is like, there's a downstairs kind of like speakeasy where Jack White plays shows sometimes for like VIPs or spontaneously. Your kid can go take hitting lessons from a former MLB player because that's in the showroom too. So there's this experiential quality. Like I was in Dallas, their headquarters in Dallas, and I grabbed like a $80 Uber to just go look at the showroom because it's just so uh, – it's such an interesting amalgam of personalities and experience and design and just like great stuff. Uh, I'd like to say Rivian. I would, but like they kind of, I don't know if they have so much a brand identity or if they just got lucky that Elon effed up Tesla so much. So I'm not quite sure how much of that is like by design or just, you know, they uh, uh, right place, right time. Yeah. War sticks really cool. Uh, I had, hadn't actually come across that before. Are you are you on the uh, the note of you being really into your son's baseball? Are you like, do you ever do the hand scoring, like uh, hand scoring the game? I've um, I'm usually just walking around and pacing and muttering <laughs> to myself way too much to sit down and score the game. Um, I'm just too busy for that. <laughs> how how old is your son? I have two, but um, one's turning 14 and the other is a little guy. The other guy's nine. That's a good uh, good competitive age. Yeah, I'm coaching the little guy. The older one is beyond my ability to help him now. <laughs> so when you, when you look at other brands, uh, you, you started talking a little bit about Tesla there, uh, but even beyond that, what, what are some of the biggest mistakes you see brands making when they're trying to connect with people on their own brand story? Yeah, the classic one, I imagine if you ask 10 marketers this question, 11 would say they make it about them and not the customer, right? That's the reflexive answer. And that may be true, but I don't know if that's as fatal as just being sanitized and being boring and being milk toast, right? Um, I think with every person that enters a room when the topic is creativity or narrative, there is an incremental degradation of the original inspiration. Ideas don't get better in a bigger room. They get genericized in a bigger room. And so I think if you literally have no fear of losing your job, you will do better work. The minute you start to get into pleasing mode, and I'll grab a word from this person, or I won't do that imagery because for whatever reason that person doesn't like it, and you start to cobble something together, you've just sucked the soul out of it. There was a, uh, I don't know if it's true line that Andy Warhol said or just like attributed to him, but in Songs for Drella, the Lou Reed and John Cale collaboration to celebrate the life of uh, Andy Warhol. There's a, there's a lyric that says, it's attributed to Andy, that says the songs with the dirty words, make sure you leave them that way. And like metaphorically, when you start taking out the dirty words, metaphorically, obviously no brand, I don't mean that literally. But when you start taking that out, you're going to sound just like everyone else. So I think like, maybe that's a way to make it about you and not the customer, right? Like I talked about Jack White, that was about him, that wasn't about me, right? So I don't think that is necessarily fatal. To me, what's fatal is like, air quotes here, taking all the dirty words out. Right, like just sanitizing something to please internal constituents in the name of keeping your job. So this is good stuff. And by the way, uh, congratulations on being the first person to reference Lou Reed on this podcast. Uh, it's only one. <laughs> only one Lou. 
Yeah. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you on that note because I feel you on that. And I, my personal experience has been that some of that sanitizing happens in the process of we can make this a lot more simple and clear, right? So I'm, I'm curious how, and, and it's, that's like an art form in itself, right? It's, it's like, how do you make it simple and clear without being generic? A good example is maybe at the value proposition level. It's like all roads lead to, lead to like, it saves you time and money, you know? Yeah, and yeah. <laughs> so how do you, how do you think about that balance you know, say if you are working in a dynamic duo and you still have this value for simplicity, how do you kind of land on that elegant, simple, clear without ending up in generic territory? Um, well, you have to have the guts to point out to someone, particularly that person is more quote unquote powerful than you in the organization that you've transitioned from simple to generic. Um, there is, oh my God, I'm going to talk about music yet again. It'll be Jack White, Lou Reed, John Cale, and um, yeah, um, the Hold Steady. So, and I don't know if it was their last album or that album before, they have, um, they have this song about like, sort of like dead end salesman with a, uh, kind of low level drug addiction that is on the road selling some software and trying to score. But there's a line in it where he says like, um, we, um, it's, we help offices operate more efficiently. And that's what he describes the product is doing. And it's not a compliment. Right, like it's just this like sense of this sort of bleakness you feel for the poor guy, and I, you know, if I had more time to Google it and get the lyric just right, I would. Um, but I have actually brought that up in meetings where I've said we sound awfully similar to this guy in this song, and let me tell you, it's not a good thing. And that's kind of what I mean by Exhibit A of being okay if like you're no longer the right person for the company or they want somebody that's just like, doesn't quite have that um, bristly um, um, bias. But like, that's where you go from being precise and simple to being watered down. And um, it's on like everyone else, like that poor salesman, that song. Wow. You, uh, you nailed that answer. <laughs> it's a, it really got me thinking we we've uh i i've i've really like honestly struggled with this cuz like i personally have just this value on the nuance or like i sometimes think that's like maybe it's a value for originality that sometimes lands me in like confusing territory <laughs> um but it's uh something i've learned to respect more you know it's like when you actually see that it just takes, it takes a lot more time, right? Like it's, and I think, I think in some ways, sometimes that like more nuanced view that's like expanded upon is like, uh, probably like I'm doing right now. It's like when you don't actually know the answer (laughs) and, and so it's like, okay, let's like, just keep adding color to this. And it's like, maybe it's part of the process of just working out what you actually think and what you actually want to say. And it's it's at at a stage where you're not quite sure what's going to resonate with people yet. So it's like, Oh, let's cover all of our bases and maybe show how much we know and how much we think about this stuff. But I think it's that step further where it's like, yeah, having the courage to go. Uh, I like this Stephen King. I I think it's originally his like kill your darlings, you know, just, I think he actually says kill your babies, which is kind of intense. Uh, But yeah, it's, it's like uh, having the courage to like ditch the stuff you're kind of in love with to just make it more clear to people. I I think is a, take some wisdom and experience for sure. And like, you got to know when something's over seasoned, right? Like 
at some point you've just masked the taste of the thing that you wanted to eat with all the stuff you put on it. And like if you're in a room and everybody's talking something through and it's getting to the point that it's just like there's too much goop on the thing you're trying to say, like you've got to know when to stop and say like, we've just ripped the heart out of it because we buried it in goop. Heavy Covenant is the name of the song, by the way, if you want to look it up. Nice. I like, I like the, just, just scrape, scrape off the goop. It's a good way to say it. <laughs> That's going to be our soundbite for this episode. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so shifting gears a little bit. Um, Obviously, everyone's talking about the economy. You go on LinkedIn, you go on Twitter, you turn on the news. People are talking about the economy, interest rates going up, potentially we're headed towards recession. Um, against that backdrop, what are you seeing in terms of trends for what's working and what's not working? Obviously, it's not 2020, not 2021 anymore where you know we're in the ZERP era. Um, are there some things that are really standing out to you? Um, yeah. And, uh, John, I mentioned John Miller, he posted on this recently on LinkedIn and I commented, and I think he was exactly right. Um, there was a playbook that we all followed for a long time. And we as like B2B tech marketers followed and John really was one of the major authors of it. And, um, then everything changed to your point. And the original playbook really has one underlying assumption, and that is the only constraint in a business is sales capacity. Demand is limitless. You just need enough quality sellers to be able to field all that demand. And so we talk about funnels, but all that really mattered was the top. How wide can you make that dang thing? And right now, that demand is harder to come by than it's ever been, at least in my career. And it's because most buyers, I think John had some report that estimated up to 95% of software buyers would be software buyers are sitting on the sidelines, not actively looking for product. So if you're running the same playbook and you're trying to stretch the top of that funnel as wide as you can, but there's only 5% of the people in market that used to be, you are going to fail. And also, you're going to be really inefficient because you got everybody fighting over that 5%. And so your costs are going to increase. So the way I'm looking at it, the way my team is looking at it, the way Pendo is looking at it is what if we operate off the assumption that there's only so much width we're going to be able to stretch the top of that funnel. And now let's think about what happens after there's a interested buyer, so a opportunity in B2B parlance. And what can we do to increase the probability that we're going to get that person to go on to a, you know, a, to purchase? And so we have this incredible data science team that we've looked at like every deal we've ever won, every deal we've ever lost, and what activity they've engaged with with marketing that correlate to good outcomes. And I have a whole team right now that is only measured on getting all of our opportunities to engage in this like finite number of activities that have a positive correlation to successful outcomes for the business. So I really am spending a lot of my time in the middle of the funnel. One of those activities is how many people other than that person in the company are engaged with Pendo materials? Why? Because they don't make decisions on buyers, don't make decisions in isolation anymore, right? People have a higher bar to clear to go and buy something. Budget is harder to come by, so they probably have to borrow from another department. Well, that department needs to have a vested interest in the outcome. CFO probably needs to be involved in even smaller purchases. We've seen small, relatively small purchases that board members get involved in. The actual board of directors getting involved in $20,000 deals. So it's all kind of, um, it's more layered now. And so how many of the layers can we get? Not just the buyer, but all these stakeholders that the buyer has to convince. How do we get all of them to 
have some propensity to favor Pendo. And so we've shifted a lot of our focus from the top of the funnel to everything that happens after an opportunity is created. The challenge, there's a, another, I guess, philosophy, is um, I just talked to a CMO about this the other day, is um, that all sounds good on paper. But if you don't have the right KPIs in place, you're going to get drawn right back into top of funnel marketing. And it's because of the streetlight effect. So the streetlight effect, I don't, are you familiar with it? All right. Uh, it is a, it's a bias where you look for something in the place that you imagine you'll find it. So the story goes, somebody is on the side of the road, hands and knees looking in, uh, uh, looking for something. Somebody else sees them, comes over, says, what are you looking for? He says, I lost my watch. He gets on his hands and knees, tries to help. Nobody finds the watch. So the, you know, the, the person doing the good deed says, well, are you sure you dropped it here? And the other guy says, no, I dropped it over there. He says, well, why are we looking here? He said, well, here's where the light is. So what we end up doing is running marketing programs where the light is. Running marketing programs in the areas that we can measure or in the areas that we have KPIs, and those are all top of funnel because the new playbook hasn't been rewritten yet. So if you have somebody saying we want to stretch the middle of the funnel, but the way you keep your job is at the top of the funnel, then what are you going to do? You're going to do, you're going to look for the watch under the street light, even if it's not where the value is. Right. And so we really have to be careful of this. I say often there's no bad people. It's just bad KPIs. If we're giving somebody a KPI to stretch the top of the funnel, but asking them to spend their time trying to be multi-layered within a company, well, we're asking them to act in a way that's inconsistent with their own self-interest and their own self-interest is keeping their job. So. I believe that the value is in the middle of the funnel right now, but the only way marketing leaders are going to be successful there is if they can find a way to shine the street light there. And that means attaching the right goals to that behavior, the right incentives to that behavior. And just to clarify for people listening, what, what do you, how do you define that middle span of the funnel? It's everything that happens after sales has said, yes, I think I can sell this deal. So once sales has created an opportunity, usually it's a domain of sales and marketing. You know, you go back and try to get more leads, let sales wrestle this one to the ground. Well, like now more than one person has to wrestle it to the ground because it's a lot harder to bring down. So what I mean is now sales is having active conversations. They're talking about price. They're talking about when we could get started. They're talking about what other competitors the company might be looking into. How do we as a marketing organization, keep that person engaged. Rather than have a dinner for a bunch of people you're trying to get to talk to sales, why not have a dinner with everybody who's actually talking to sales? So it's a shift in focus from trying to get sales sort of, to use a sports metaphor, more at-bats, to trying to get sales more hits from the limited at-bats they have. That's that's really cool. It's a cool f focus, and I appreciate what you're saying about that tension that individual people feel. It's a good take on vanity metrics, you know. Just that that uh, if you're you because you are we we've seen this, you know, just with you know certain clients over the years where you know everyone wants the brand recognition, brand awareness, and then as you dig deeper, it's ultimately like. We need to drive more qualified leads, you know. Um, but I I like what you're saying about, uh, you know, basically enhancing the effectiveness of, you know, once you get those leads, how are you cherishing them and and truly making the most of each opportunity? They're harder to come by now, so you just got to get more out of them, more yield. It's from I just talk about yield a lot. It's really I guess that's a simpler way to put it. Is the focus needs to shift to 
from volume to yield. Okay, so from a AI standpoint, which is you know increasingly becoming par for the course in products, uh, the some of the novelty factor there is kind of came and faded a bit quickly. Uh, how, how are you thinking about establishing a unique take at Pendo? Um, yeah, earlier I talked about being sort of the patron saint of the product manager and how that's allowed us to tell a brand story that um, resonates. I think we did the same thing when it comes to AI. From a product development standpoint, we've really broken down like the things that harangue a product manager, like where they spend their time that they don't want to spend their time, where they wish they could add more value. Uh, And we're applying AI to exactly those areas of the product so that it'll, so that's not in conflict with what our buyer does. It's not a threat to our buyer. It's a compliment to our buyer. And I think we could only do that by really understanding who that person is and what makes that person tick. So we have like three categories, three themes for our future AI releases and everything will ladder up to those themes and those themes all map to what our buyer struggles with and where AI can be an antiseptic. From a marketing standpoint, I don't know, guys, like a lot of CMOs I respect are on LinkedIn, just like pontificating about AI. And I have no idea if any of them are actually using it or if they just see this as their like opportunity to get some clicks. Maybe I sound jaded in that because like I was that guy for a long time, but I'm like, really, man, like you, you are this much of a self-appointed authority. So do i use it sure like i'll say you know here's a new product we're thinking of coming out with give me 15 taglines 14 of them are trash one of them is like hey i think i could work with this but what it does is like there's nothing more intimidating than a blank page i don't have a blank page problem thanks to ai so like that's not going to impress a single Influ- CMO influencer because they're going to be like, well, I was there three years ago. Well, okay, I'm there now, but I actually use it for that and it actually helps me. Uh, what I want to see is AI just helping, not replacing, but helping our SDRs write much better emails, much more relevant emails, not personalized and like, I know what town you live in, so I'm just going to arbitrarily reference what town you live in and like name a restaurant in your town and call it personalized. I get that. But like map what that business is struggling with to what value prop our product has and help the SDR write an actually relevant message in a shorter period of time. That's what I would like it to do. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Joe, well, I know we're at time right now, but it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Um, This is going to be one of those episodes where people are going to have to listen twice just to ensure they get all the wisdom from what you shared. Uh, And for those that want to learn more about you and follow you uh, for your journey, where's the best place for them to find you online? I actually post most on LinkedIn now. Um, You know, Twitter, that had its period for me, but that window closed. So I'm more active on LinkedIn. Yeah. Awesome. Joe, thanks again. Uh, You got it. it It was a pleasure. Have a great day.